My today's guest is Jonas Gantenbein from Bank Frick. Bank Frick is obviously one of the most well-known banks in the blockchain and crypto space. We will talk about the upcoming market and crypto assets regulation. We will talk about future opportunities. And I asked Jonas how Bank Frick makes their money with banking services in the blockchain space. I'm really looking forward to our today's talk. Hello and welcome to Coffee from the Block from the House of Blockchain in Liechtenstein. My today's guest is Jonas Gantenbein. He is the head of digital assets from Bank Frick. Welcome to Coffee from the Block, Jonas. It's good Thank to have you. you here. Thank you for having me. So you are one out of almost 40,000 Liechtenstein inhabitants. And not only inhabitants, but Liechtenstein citizens. And you live in Mauren or you are originally from Mauren in Liechtenstein? One of the few, yes, but not living in Mauren anymore. I uh, traveled all, all the way through the country to uh, Triesen now. To Triesen, not all the way to the, the other country. The other side of the country. Okay, but it's a, it's a rare species or Liechtensteinians are a rare species. Yes. So Jonas, you're now head of digital assets at Bank Frick. Um, how did you end up at Bank Frick and what does a head of digital assets do at a bank? That's a good question. Um, I'd say my journey has not been as straightforward as others. Um, I, I studied uh, business administration um, economics. Um, I am an economist by trade um, and did that until 2013. I back then was also engaged uh, in professional sports. I did bobsleigh for the, the, the Liechtenstein national team. What is and that? You bob, did bobsleigh? Bob bobsleigh, you know, the, the yeah. cool runnings, uh, yeah. the, the, the Jamaicans. Uh, we did that for Liechtenstein. Did for, you win anything? Yeah. Were you like... Uh, yes, we won some uh, European Cups and some America Cups. We participated uh, in World Championships and uh, also we qualified for Olympia to 2010. That so was. you're the cool runnings of Liechtenstein? <laughs> even better, I'd say. <laughs> even better, okay. <laughs> yes, uh, I did that for a while and then I, I, I um, started to work in the financial sector in Liechtenstein. But um, after two, three years, I, we, I recognized... We, we, which, like which part of the financial sector? I was uh, an assistant auditor you know, with, a, with a more prominent auditing company in, in Liechtenstein. Um, and, uh, but then um, thought to myself, or recognized that... It, the world has more to offer, basically, and so I did a 180 and um, started studying physics uh, in the nearby country, Switzerland. And there, uh, the first time, that, that was the first time, actually, where I uh, came in contact with um, cryptography and ultimately Bitcoin when we, in math class, um, looked at SHA-265 uh, uh, functions and, and how to prove those. And that was sort of uh, the first stepping stone out of very uh, uh, of many stepping stones, basically, uh, which brought me to the, to but the place I But was that roughly? That was in 2016. But when you learned about SHA-256, you did not talk about Bitcoin at your courses at the university? Uh, or? Yeah, we did, we did. You did? Okay. We did, we did. And then, then was it was... early then, right? It, it was quite, quite early, and, and I sort of started to look into the rabbit hole back then. And um, I, I, it took some time to develop. Uh, still being at uni, still being at the, the physics uni, um, in 2017, the whole discussion of uh, ICO and the ICO bubble basically... Uh, started filling, and there I shifted my focus more towards crypto and what it is and what it is supposed to be and how they, it got treated uh, back then. And after the burst of the, the, the ICO bubble, late 2017, uh, early 2018, uh, it was clear for me that I wanted to, to work in that space. So it was clear for you when everything went south? Yes. You said, that's exactly, that's the exactly I want. where I want to be. <laughs> okay. That's exactly where that's I want to be. And, and, and uh, also, there are a lot of, you know, back then, the, the focus, and today still is, the, the focus was very, very um, nuanced on the speculation aspect of those mm. tokens, of those uh, digital assets. And I never quite fully understood that because ultimately it's an infrastructure piece, blockchain mm. as, uh, as itself. And uh, I thought back then, because coming from uh, economics and knowing how, how financial institutions work, um, 
I, I thought to myself that that's an infrastructure piece I, we could leverage and we should leverage in the future. And that's how the journey started also then with Bank Frick. I came back uh, from uni and um, started right, uh, right after, as soon as possible, um, I got a, a job offer at Bank Frick and I started then in, in 2019. And what was your first uh, job description? Uh, it was a project development uh, in blockchain. So I was tasked with leading projects um, over innovative um, um, blockchain, you know, efforts such as tokenization was a topic back then, still is, of course, but was a big topic back then. Um, custody, we had to sort of find a framework that was banking grade, and that's how, not how we did that, uh, custody back then. And those topics... I, I, I would say my experience uh, stems today, stems a lot of those times where we really got a time in a banking environment to look at things and look at uh, the infrastructure blockchain could provide. Yeah, so, and, and that was the beginning for you and then you're now head of digital assets. What, what, is, what does your average day look like today? Uh, well, yeah, you obviously the... come to office 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, no, I head off. Uh, I, I don't need to show up early. Um, no, it's, uh, it's quite diverse, I'd say. Um, it's from, I, in, in, in the department I work with, work with and actually I, I had the opportunity to, to build uh, as such, um, we focus on, on a few parts. The one, I think the biggest part and the most important part is management of systems. Bank Frick is a, um, is a service provider for its clients, but also uses external third-party infrastructure mm -hmm. to uh, leverage that infrastructure that it does not build on its own. But we have to manage security, governance, all those pieces integrated in legacy systems, and that's a big chunk of what we do. The other big chunk is um, innovation. The whole topic of we we were first in 2017, but uh, are not necessarily now because institutions have have caught up. Um, 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 and now we try to achieve, or we try to the head start we got. We try to to remain uh, there in in that leading position, uh, or even uh, build build upon that uh, that advantage we we gathered uh, a few years ago. So we need to be very innovative in terms of what kind of products we want to offer our customers, but also in terms of, that's the income side of, of, a, of a balance statement, um, but also on the cost side, how can we be more efficient with blockchain? How would that look like? Uh, settlement piece is a, is a, a set, the instant settlement um, piece of blockchain is very important and will be very important in the future for banking. So when people think about blockchain banking, it's not that everybody has the same picture. But you already mentioned a little bit in the, in the really early, early days. I do remember when we, when we brought the first clients uh, to, to Bank Frick, we, we basically, you were back then a, a payment-focused bank. You, you, still are, you are still a payment-focused bank. Mm -hmm. um, and what the clients back then needed was a bank willing to offer banking services for clients who then do something with blockchain. Yep. So you mentioned ICOs back then when they wanted uh, to do their fundraiser. Uh, they needed a, a regular bank account where the proceeds came in and they could actually pay their salary and they have an e-banking solution. Correct. And that actually then switched because nowadays, as you said, you also use blockchain yourself. So you, you use it to provide your normal banking services, if I understood that correctly, or you actually work on that at least, right? Exactly right, yes. How we started, I mean, a bank or a financial institution basically has three ways today, if it had, had never contact with blockchain before, it, there are three ways in general how a bank enters the, the space. First and the, the easiest one, easiest with uh, quotation marks, would be that um, the bank offers classical banking services accounting, whatever, uh, to the to blockchain corporates. What's the challenge there? You said the easiest... Yeah, well, there's all, always a compliance department uh, <laughs> that, that uh, needs to, to, uh, to uh, know how blockchain works and how business model around blockchain mm. work, and that can be sort of a, um, a challenge. But that's, I, I'd say, if, if we discuss an hour about the topic, it, be, it becomes clear, at the, but the bottom line is, 
the transparency of the blockchain ultimately only helps mm. for banks. But ban banks have not caught up to that idea yet. Mm. So it's still a hurdle or a gap between there. There has to be some um, transfer of knowledge to be done in order for those for the traditional banks to enter the space. But there are banks, quite mm. big banks, co Commerzbank, etc., who, who are entering through providing classical banking services to blockchain corporates. That's the first vector. The second vector would be custody of tokens. Mm -hmm. a, a, a bit of a different piece because you need infrastructure, you need tech savviness, you need the know-how, how to incorporate those, those uh, or how to integrate your blockchain uh, systems uh, with legacy systems. That's a challenge, can be. And the third you, you, you're basically talking that you use your IT infrastructure, like the banking core yep. applications, how you provide your classical banking services, and now we have something which has like eight digits after. Obvious, that's an obvious, uh, <laughs> obvious yeah, one, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. It's but hard. that's a challenge, yeah. depending on what core uh, banking system you, you, you're you using. Yeah. So those hurdles are slowly getting uh, overcome, um, but still, can be a challenge because a bank uh, certainly needs to have that pro uh, the, the processes right uh, in yeah. order to, to provide a service to its customers because it's so heavily regulated. And there is also a regulator in the picture who has to approve it beforehand. But that regulation is, is, is uh, uh, fa uh, coming, coming, up, coming up fast. So um, I think we will see much more of those advancements for, from other banks as well. You were pioneering, obviously, in Liechtenstein, blockchain or banking for blockchain companies. That was in, in the very, very early days. Mm -hmm. You then actually, uh, you became the, the first registered company under the TVTG. So yep. the first registration uh, of any service provider in Liechtenstein was Bankfit. Um, I do remember that quite well. Fun, fun fact: We we I think we applied, or the guys uh, back in the office applied one day before the the TVTG came into power. So uh, <laughs> okay. rumor rumor has it that those guys at the FMA didn't know what to do with the application they received. <laughs> <laughs> it was good that, that you. Find, but I I think obviously, and and that is also true. I mean, you have to ask yourself, um, and specifically if you now think about the upcoming market in crypto assets regulation. Uh, in Europe, where basically um, the service providers which are already licensed, they're exempted uh, from, from getting an additional license. Um, if it's the same business model, so as, as a bank, you don't have to, to get a specific extra license on yeah. Amica. Um, and obviously, uh, that, is, that, that, that should be and was a discussion as well, should banks just be allowed to provide these services as well. My personal opinion on that is, I think that um, it's not 100% necessary, but I think the risks uh, involved are a little bit different. It's, it's, therefore, I think it's good if also a regulator um, points into the right direction and, and, a, and a specific law and license should, should ask for the specific requirements if you do business and provide business with these new technologies. So I think it's, it was not the wrong decision of Liechtenstein to say, even for banks, it should, but it should be a rather easy process. Like anything else should be very easy. Only like this, like differences from how you provide services with these technologies. For, for example, custody. Yeah. That's, that's an obvious one, right? Yeah. That's yeah. a very technical thing. You already touched on that, that that's, yeah. uh, that's one of the pieces where you put a lot of efforts in to make that properly, right? Or to do that properly. I would love to see high barriers of entry because mm. that uh, keeps us from, from having competition in the market. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. what do you think about, and I, obviously I, I do have a very strong opinion on that, but I want to, to hear your opinion. Uh, what do you think about the upcoming Mika regulation? Is that an opportunity for, for Liechtenstein, for Liechtenstein service providers? Is it more of a challenge? Um, and yeah, maybe you can explain a little bit, Mika. Um, yeah. What does it mean for you, specifically as a Liechtenstein bank? I, I was just thinking, I think it's multidimensional. For one, we have customers. Um, to understand that we, we are... Uh, um, execution only bank. So we provide infrastructures for our customers, crypto corporates, exchanges uh, and mm -hmm. whatnot to function properly, have a fiat and a crypto leg we do on and off ramps, etc. Mm -hmm. 
So for those guys, I'd say it's uh, heavily anticipated, uh, especially the, 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 the passporting part mm -hmm. of it, so that they can do business under, under an umbrella or under a, under a framework that uh, is very clear and stringent, because it wasn't in, in the past, and we have seen that a lot of business, business models um, start to be become uh, you know, apparent in the market or start to, to, to get some tractions mm -hmm. in the market, but then got shut down because of uh, lack in regulation. Especially for us, um, depending on the business model, of course, it was from time to time very hard to accept customers mm -hmm. because of if you're dealing with crypto, you're already high risk. Very high risk if there is a, uh, there is a, a business model involved with um, certain factors like uh, jurisdiction mm -hmm. or, or um, you know, complexity. And we, we saw that missing regulation was um, oftentimes the, the missing link for those guys, for those companies to operate properly and to passport or to, to open their services to, to a, a EU market, for example. Let That's me, going to change. Let me just uh, try to explain that a little bit better for those of, of you who don't know about passporting and, and, and what the concept is. In sure. the European uh, Union framework, um, if you have one regulation, which is applicable in all of the European Union, European Economic Area member states, uh, Liechtenstein is a part of the European Economic Area, if you're licensed in one member state, you can also uh, provide your products and services based on these passporting principles to all of the other member states. So coming back, for example, to the banking example, Bank Frick, as a Liechtenstein bank, could passport its banking services uh, to all of the member states. And the same would, will be applicable under the marketing crypto assets regime. And that allows you to access 23 million plus businesses and 450 million plus consumers in the European uh, single market with one license. And that is what you said, that is the key for businesses to easily provide the products and services to a big market, right? They don't have to go to every jurisdiction and every country and ask uh, for a new license or a specific license. That's the one part of it, so it makes it easier for businesses. But on the other hand, for you it's easier because if you want to bank uh, companies now, it's the Mika custody license and it's exactly. almost it's the same in Portugal as it is in France as it is in Germany or in Liechtenstein or in Austria yeah. and and that makes your life also easier on the other hand because it's a same level playing field right they have to fulfill the same requirements and therefore this license is a very very powerful uh, one no question about it yes absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. and for you as a bank are you actively working on on preparing for Mika yes we do uh, well it as far as it, it does concern us with our own infrastructure, there are parts of it, uh, such as staking, for example, or DeFi we are looking into as of now, how we could leverage those, the, that aspect of blockchain. Um, that is not covered and that's um, sort of pro problematic, maybe, mm -hmm. could be, uh, does not necessarily have to be, but it could mm -hmm. be. Um, but we are actively looking into what, what does Mika mean for our processes, for our governance uh, structures we have, what we need to change, maybe reporting, you know, um, all those kinds of different steps you have to go, uh, you have to undertake uh, as a regulated bank. Yeah. And so now Mika is around the corner. You said you're, you're going to prepare uh, for that um, today, now in, in 2023. How can a bank make money with offering services. Can you give us a little bit of a hint? What are your revenue streams? What is the profitable part of, of your business? Um, well, as you, as you and the audience uh, knows, uh, that we, ha we had a bear market for the last couple of months. <laughs> it's so it's not, necessarily, <laughs> yes, uh, it's not necessarily uh, the, 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 the digital assets um, the offerings we had out there that uh, uh, were the, the most revenue drivers. Mm. We, we've come from a place, we, we were founded in for 20, 25 years ago, and we were founded as a private bank slash intermediary bank, heavily focused on intermediaries locally, Liechtenstein, East, uh, Eastern Switzerland. And we slowly expanded that uh, narrative into we uh, had a, an agreement with Visa and Mastercard uh, be, to be an acquirer for them, and uh, we had uh, we built a funds and capital markets desk where we 
for one um, acted as a as a custodian for for funds uh, or a paying agent but also we we st helped structuring own products for our customers and so we built up sl slowly but surely we built up a few different verticals so now we have the classic banking arm that's how we started for intermediaries wealth managers uh, and so on not uh, uh, not uh, heavily focused on DLT, just classic banking mm -hmm. as it is. Fancy capital markets, as I, as I said before, um, the, the acquiring as, th as a third. And since uh, 2017, as mentioned before, we pivoted our strategy a bit into blockchain banking as well. And how we started is we, we started with providing the crypto corporates with banking services, classic banking services. That was it giving accounts to, to mm. crypto corporates. Then we slowly transition into not only providing classical banking services to crypto corporates, but also providing um, blockchain services to non-crypto native um, companies that we had in under our umbrella from all the other verticals. So custody is the centerpiece, obviously. You need to have custody to do, engage mm. with any kind of um, 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 DLT. Then we uh, dipped our toes into tokenization. We launched a staking product earlier this year uh, at the very beginning. Um, we now are looking into, you know, leveraging DeFi and whatnot. But I'd say the main, the centerpiece, how we earn money is through classical banking, especially in the blockchain sector, mm -hmm. banking exchanges, banking brokers, um, do fiat business for them. Mm -hmm. Fiat on, on and off ramp and uh, custody accounts, fiat custody accounts. You said custody is a is a is a is a very important piece. Yeah. Um, do you own hardware wallets? Do you play around with them, or are you a fully no no? I, I trust third parties to do that person um, in a banking context. No, uh, as you uh, as an individual. Uh, yes, you I, own us. yeah, well, uh, sure. I, <laughs> I, I own hardware wallets. Um, but I can see an argument where uh, I'd say the majority of the population in, in 10 years would not engage with uh, an, an abstract uh, mm. USB stick um, and, and delegate to a validator in order to stake and whatnot. So the user experience, I think, is a, a critical role. And also um, the, the advantage of, that the bank offers is the segregation of assets, mm. customer or protection of default uh, in, in a sense. So security is, especially for institutional providers, uh, a very big, a very big uh, aspect of choosing where to go with their coins. Uh, and, and Bank Frick, as a fully regulated bank, the coins are not part of insolvency mass. Mm -hmm. So if we would go bust, the, the business continuity is, uh, is granted and, mm -hmm. and uh, the institutions uh, can have, uh, have full access to their money anyways. And that is what I always say, like banks do have the trust of, of their clients, right? And yeah. they can actually provide these kind of services uh, for people who are not willing and, and capable of just understanding and do the deep dive, which is obviously needed before you start to really think about doing self-custody with, with a little bit bigger amounts, right? Yeah. I mean, there's... There are a lot of stories where people lose access to their funds because they were not dealing with hardware wallets properly. Yeah, exactly. And that's the retail case, right? Um, for retail customers, mm -hmm. that's I think the main piece would be the main storyline is customer journey, mm -hmm. user usability of, of, of it's, it's it's easier to log into an, an e-banking system than to deal with a with a, a ledger stick. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd argue. But the, the other piece is institutionals are they. They won't do self custody because of regulatory reasons and of security reasons and reasons of accountability mm. because they manage other people's money and they need a third party to rely on to trust on if something goes south. You're also uh, having the innovation uh, under your watch, so to say. So, what is the next big thing? What do you think is the well, next big thing? I think we've thought, we spoke about that before, and uh, we had we had a discussion on whether it is metaverse or, or <laughs> DeFi. <laughs> and I'm in the DeFi corner, and, and you obviously metaverse. But um, I, I I still think DeFi has a, a value proposition that is unbeatable. Mm. If if we manage the, the 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 regulatory aspect of it, so obviously the question mm. is how do we regulate something? 
without borders in a borderless regime? Who mm. is who is to be the, the one who who regulates DeFi in the end? Mm. But I, I, I think still there can be fully isolated compartments within the DeFi space that leverage the, I'd say, the underlying infrastructure, but operate in a in a compartment that is that is isolated and fully protected regulatory wise mm. in terms of AML, KYC, and whatnot. And my, so I I, I think my uh, forecast would be that in, in a couple of years banks will heavily look uh, mm. for those instant settlement pieces um, yeah I mean I, I I'm not only um, a, a big fan of of the development around virtual realities and, and metaverses also about DeFi but uh, I, I love technology so for me it's not one specific thing and I sometimes think that we come up with a new innovation and the next big thing is something we already did for years. Mm -hmm. Now we just come up with a new name and then, wow, that's now the new buzzword everybody talks about, right? Yeah. But yeah. For me, DeFi was, okay, but we do that since years. Like, what's the new part of it, right? Exactly but, right. <laughs> yeah. But coming to an end, my final question to all of my guests is, what is your favorite coffee? And I asked you before I made it, which is uh, like the average espresso drinker wants to have a dark roasted, um, uh, very intense chocolatey um, coffee, right? With a, like no acidity at all. Mm -hmm. But you immediately said, no, no, for me, acidity is fine. I like the fruity notes. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite coffee? I'm a, a passionate espresso drinker. And I'd say the, the more Italian-esque it gets, the better. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I like it uh, very strong and, mm -hmm. as we said, dark. Mm -hmm. Nice. You said something else. Yes, I said uh, <laughs> I like my espresso dark as my humor and the future of Argentina. Yes. Uh, great. Thank you very much, uh, Jonas, for your time. Thank uh, you very looking much. forward to, to uh, have you soon here again. Maybe we can talk about your experiences with Mika uh, in, in, a, in a half a year or in a year or two um, when we finally then, then really see how it is in practice. Um, Thank you very much again and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for having me.